Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Dark Matter Knits podcast. This is episode 21. It's December 5th, no, December 6th, 2014. And I'm Elizabeth Green Musselman. Hello. I'm recording a day late because I started recording yesterday and I was babbling and not making any sense. So I'm going to start over today and we will see how it goes. So t the theme for today is wanderlust. And uh, I'll describe more about that in a moment. But the basic idea is that um, I watched a really interesting TED Talk this week. If you haven't come across these before, I'll tell you more about them in a moment. Um, but a friend, of, a friend of mine sent it to me, and it just got me thinking about uh, the desire to ditch old things and start something new, to go wandering, and who feels that and who doesn't, and when. Um, I have a couple of things to review today that kind of brought up the theme of Wanderlust too, because they're both coming to me directly or indirectly from another country. And uh, yeah, just seemed like a good thing to talk about for today. And the technique video that we're going to do at the end is uh, if you have, <laughs> it's always kind of funny trying to tie the technique in, but if you have a stitch that has gone wandering, i.e. it has dropped, how to pick it up with a crochet hook. Again, as always, these are things that you may or may not already know how to do. So if you don't, stick around till the end. All right. So before I get into the, the themey stuff, let me do a couple of announcement-y kind of things. The first thing is that uh, a couple of people have contacted me about uh, some crowdfunded um, fiber businesses, uh, fiber business campaigns that they wanted to let you know about. One of these people I know directly and another somebody else contacted me about. So if you've not come across crowdfunding before, you probably have. If you are if you watch podcasts, you're probably web savvy enough to have heard of crowdfunding before. But just in case you haven't heard of it, it's basically uh, there are a number of websites, uh, the most famous of which is Kickstarter. And they're basically a way for people to raise relatively small amounts of money to support a project of some kind, and often it's a small business. And in this case, these are both fiber businesses that have been going for a while, but need an infusion of cash to bump it up to the next level. And so, you know, you could traditionally, you would just have a small business loan to make that work. But the way that crowdfunding works is that a number of people give a small amount of money to sometimes larger amounts. You can choose what amount you want to give. The money doesn't get paid back, but there is, uh, for each level, it's sort of like when you donate to public television or public radio, you get a small gift as a reward for various levels of giving. So that's how it works. And the two, uh, the two projects that I wanted to tell you about, one of them is, um, it's M-I-R-L-A, it might be pronounced Mirla Fiber Arts Kickstarter. So this is on the site Kickstarter. I'll have links in the show notes. A woman named Jen Riley, who runs Mirla Fiber Arts. It's a uh, a dying business and D-Y-E, that is, her business is not dying. And she is running a Kickstarter. Uh, the goal is, I believe, $6,000 to basically to be able to uh, get some equipment and be able to buy more inventory at once uh, so that she can dye up larger batches of things. And... Um, her name is Jenny McKenzie. She lives in Oregon, and as it turns out, she's a cancer survivor. And this is her way of basically making a living after going through some some medical difficulties. So uh, a very worthy campaign. Um, Jen Riley, who is Tangled, Tangled Mania on Ravelry, contacted me about that. And then uh, the other one is... Yarn Carnival, who has a campaign going on Indiegogo, which is another crowdfunding site. And she is local to me. She's an Austin-based dyer. She's been going for, I think, a couple of years now. And you might remember I showed you, I don't unfortunately have any of your yarn here to show you, but I got one of her shawl pins. This is a copper, hammered copper shawl pin. Very pretty. And I just liked how the simplicity of it and just, you know, the way you can kind of poke it, poke it through. Um, her husband makes these and she makes the most beautiful yarn. Um, one of her signature, 
yarns that she does is uh, she does these sets where there are two different skeins that go together. You can get them separately, of course, but they, they look great together. So one, one skein will be a kind of semi-solid, very saturated color, like a hot pink or a turquoise or a celadon green. And then the other skein is gray, this really beautiful uh, kettle dyed gray with little speckles or splotches of the other color in it. So, you know, if you had the hot pink, there would be the gray with speckles of the hot pink running through it. And you can just imagine the gorgeous shawl or garment or whatever that would make. Uh, so yeah, I, I love, Anna Clerk is the name of the woman who is the main person behind Yarn Carnival. I love her stuff and I adore her and I would really like for her to, her campaign to succeed too. She is trying to purchase equipment and uh, like Mirla Fiber Arts, more inventory so that she can die faster. D-Y-E. Faster. <laughs> Okay, second bit of businessy thing is that we had a giveaway running up until yesterday, and that was for this beautiful skein of yarn and these lovely stitch markers that go with it from October House Fiber Arts. This was a very popular giveaway. There were 125 of you who entered for this, or 124 actually, who entered for this giveaway. And I loved reading your responses to my question, which was about, I asked you to go look at the website and say what kind of memories her website evoked for you, because she has a very specific palette and a very rich look to her site. And uh, the the kinds of memories that you all talked about were really wonderful to read. And I, I tagged uh, Robin from October House to come over and read them. And she, she really, she told me later she really loved reading through them. So... That was very fun. So I have done done the drawing ahead of time, and the number that I drew is number 94, who is Jenny Heiss 56, and she, sorry, I had this up until just a minute ago, and now I need to bring it up again. I wanted to read you what she said. So she's number 94, which is on the previous page. So she said, that color of yarn reminds me of the fall leaves that fell from the most spectacular maple tree ever. The tree is gone now, but I will never forget how the leaves looked like gold on the ground. Then, of course, there is the food association, and that color reminds me of pumpkin pies. I baked from the pumpkin pies that I baked from what are called sugar pumpkins. October House is genius. I loved looking at her website. Very nice work. Agreed. So Jenny Heiss, this is your skein and your stitch markers. So if you will get in touch with me, uh, I am Dark Matter Knits on Ravelry, or you can email me directly at darkmatternits at gmail.com, and I will just send me your your full name and your uh, your mailing address, and I will get, get these things to you. Congratulations. So I have some other... I'm suddenly inundated with wonderful giveaways to tell you about. Um, another one that I have for you is from this wonderful person, Charon Seychar. I hope I'm saying your last name. I, I asked you how to say your first name, and then I realized I didn't ask you how to say your last name. A viewer of the show who is a potter makes these beautiful pieces, and I love his color palette as well. It's actually very similar to October House now that I think about it. Um, so originally from India and is has been in the United States for some time now and uh, has been his work has been featured on the New York in the New York Times on HGTV. Uh, he's a really talented potter and is also a knitter. And so recently he started uh, thinking about how to create pottery that had a knitted texture on it. And he said it, it took him some time to work this out. Um, but he makes, look at these. Oh, look at that. I mean, seriously. Okay, so first of all, just to give you a sense of scale, this is probably about three inches across. They're little dishes. And they're mostly un, unpainted on the back. It's just got his name printed into it. And then on the front, it's glazed with this amazing knitted texture on it. And what I find so cool about this is that 
it really looks like knitting. I mean, the stitches are not perfect. They actually look like hand knitted stitches. Like see how they're slightly different in their width and the way they're positioned. I don't know how he does this. I thought at first it was a stamp, but if it is, then he's using different stamps or different parts of the stamp because they don't look exactly the same. They have slightly different um, yeah, they're just they're just a little bit different from each other. Really, really gorgeous. Um, so he sent me one for me and one for you. I'm going to let you have the green one because I think you will probably, I think more of you would probably like the green one and I really like the yellow one. So I will keep the yellow one. And thank you, Charon, for sharing that with me. And I will let you have the green one. Isn't that beautiful? So he sent these to us to as a giveaway. So I will post a thread that, um, in fact, I need to write down I'm doing that because I just got these in the mail. I will post a thread and I would like you to go over to his shop and tell us what is your favorite piece that you see there. He has some pieces that are knitted, knitting themed and some that are not. Uh, these, I believe, I bought some for my mom for her birthday in October. And I believe they come in little sets of four, these little dishes. And, um, but the one, the one we're giving away is a single singleton. So thank you very much for that. And then we also have another giveaway. I know, right? So this one, hold on. I was prepared for this yesterday and I have my iPad. I need to go grab it. Hang on. Okay. So this, this other giveaway is from uh, Lucia Payne, who is Pearl of the Pacific on Ravelry. And she has designed this lovely hat called the Triple Swell Hat. And it is, actually it's appropriately themed for today because um, she describes in the, in the description on Ravelry, she says that the hat was inspired by where she grew up in Hawaii. And she talks about how she didn't really like surfing because she used to fall off the board all the time, but she really liked playing in the ocean swells. And so this hat is, uh, you know, is kind of her attempt at representing in stitch pattern and color form the swells of the ocean in Hawaii. Really, really pretty hat and a nice, nice thing either for you or as a gift. It looks like it would knit up pretty easily. And um, here, let me show you another picture of this from the front. She's got some matching mitts that go with it that are a, a separate pattern. Here we go. So there's how they look together. And I believe that's her in the picture. Very pretty. So she offered uh, to give away a copy of the pattern to one of the viewers. How about I not put that there? And uh, and I've so I'm going to post a separate giveaway thread for that pattern and ask you to answer the question, what was your favorite place to play as a child and why? Uh, so it's, you know, kind of related to this, like she talked about liking to play in the ocean as a child. Where did you like to play as a child? So in both cases, for both the, the dish and the pattern, um, you must be a member of the group in order to be able to win. And you can enter once per person. And uh, please try to not chatter in the thread um, so that I can just do, do a regular drawing. So there it is. Thank you so much. It's really kind of you, you all to, to do, to send us stuff for, for giveaways. It's fun to be able to do that. So the theme for today, Wanderlust. I, uh, it's going to take a little bit of a story to get to why I wanted to talk about this. So the story is this, that one of the other viewers of the podcast named Joanne contacted me last week to say that she was going to be in Austin this week and uh, did I want to get together that she would really like to go see Interstellar. Her husband didn't really want to see it, but she wanted to see it with somebody. She's going to be in Austin. Would I like to go see it with her at the IMAX theater? And I was like, yeah, <laughs> because A, I get to meet Joanne, 
who I have talked to online before and who very nicely test knitted my Summer in Angers shawl for me and knit this beautiful version of it, which she wore when she met me, which was really nice. So I got to see it in person. And B, yes, I want to go see Interstellar at the IMAX because honestly, where would be the best place to see that movie? At the IMAX, obviously. So she lives in Tennessee, but she was in town with her husband uh, on one of his business trips. And so we met up at the, uh, it's actually the Texas History Museum that has the IMAX here in town. And she took me to a movie, which was really nice. And then because that wasn't nice enough, she gave me a bag that she made. And uh, it's gorgeous. I'll show you her tag in a second, but it's got this cool little business card thing in the front, or I suppose you could put, you know, stitch markers or whatever in there, little scissors. So really cute bag. Her business is called Slanted Stitches. And so the idea is that she came up with this really cool bag design that puts all of the fabric at a slant. And then this is a kind of a plastic faux leather sort of thing on the bottom so that it stays nice longer. There's a little bit of suede up here at the top and one of those cool you know, metallic snappy closures and a beautiful lining inside, really sturdy fabric. I mean, this is definitely, uh, I don't know fabrics very well, but this is a lot sturdier than quilting fabric. And yeah, just really, really gorgeous and very nicely made. Um, so this is her Etsy shop, slantedstitches.etsy.com. That's a little small, so you might not be able to see it, but it's slantedstitches.etsy.com. And uh, yeah, she does gorgeous bags. Um, so thank you so much, Joanne. This is really, really cool. And I've been using it to hold one of the things I've been working on this week. As always, I have few things to show you. I, I made uh, a bunch of stuff for my son's teachers because teachers are awesome and I love knitting them things for, for the holidays. So that stuff has all been given to his teachers, though. I made some fingerless mitts for his music teacher um, and a couple of hats for his regular teachers. And they all loved them. They sent some really sweet. I love his teachers so much. So inside my bag is the other thing I've been working on this week, which is this giant mitt. <laughs> I want to use as much of this yarn as I can because I love it so much. Uh, this is um, from Mustache Yarns, and it is her... Do I have the tag? Please tell me I know. Of course, I don't have the tag. But it's Mustache Yarns. It is her fingering weight base, and this is the uh, Dark Side of the Moon colorway based on the Pink Floyd album cover. Isn't that awesome? And uh, I'm just doing a kind of long fingerless mitt with a lot of ribbing at the bottom so that it kind of goes up to the almost to my elbow and and then I'm doing a bunch of ribbing at the top in fact I think what I'm going to do is have the ribbing go all the way up to here so that I can wear it almost like a real mitten and then fold it down when I want to use it as fingerless mitts and then I'll do the thumb and ribbing too so it fits kind of loosely which I like and uh yeah, it's just simple, simple purse knitting. I'm mostly done with the first mitt and then I will do the second one. And astute viewers may have noticed that I am no longer using the nine inch circular. Remember that? So the nine inch circular, I talked about it last time and I like it. I can see why people like it. And I was able to use it. It wasn't, it wasn't terrible. Uh, the thing is, though, that I found that I was knitting really slowly. I was having to, you know, really concentrate on doing each stitch. And when I thought about it, I was like, you know, it's taking me so enough time, extra time to do each stitch that it's actually adding up to more time than what it takes me to do magic loop, you know, to kind of pull the needle through each half round. So I went back to magic loop and sure enough, I'm flying through these mitts now. It was coming kind of slowly before and I wasn't really working on them that much. 
So yeah, I'm glad I tried these and I would definitely recommend them if it drives you crazy having to change needles all the time because th with this you can just go round and round and round and round like with a regular circular. Uh, but yeah, I don't know if they're for me, but glad I tried them. Loving the yarn though. So that's what I've been working on. And uh, back to Joanne. So Joanne, who gave me the bag, uh, we got talking, I don't even remember how this came up, but she mentioned to me this TED Talk that she had seen. And if you haven't seen TED Talks before, it's TED, as you would guess. Uh, I think it's a, it's basically like a think tank sort of thing in California. And they do, they have uh, regular talks and they televise or they put them up on their website and you can watch them for free. And they're all under 20 minutes and they're great. They basically bring in engineers, inventors, uh, philosophers, thinkers, artists, policymakers, all kinds of people who have interesting things. I think T TED stands for, I don't know what the T stands for. It's something engineering and design, but they're basically great thinkers talking about uh, big ideas is probably the best best way to put that. They're fascinating and really fun to watch. And they're just kind of that perfect little bit of bite-sized, thought-provoking stuff to watch. Fascinating. So the one that she was talking about is a, a moral philosopher, or no, sorry, a psychologist named Jonathan Haidt, H-A-I-D-T, who has this talk about um, the five foundations of morality. And the basic idea that he's talking about is that he says, you know, most people think of, think about our morality as coming from our environment, you know, that we learn from our parents and our teachers and our friends and our society and our culture. And uh, that's how we form our morality, what we think is right and wrong and how we act on that. And, uh, and he says, you know, one of the things that, that, psychologists are learning more and more, especially as we study more about the brain, is that some aspects of our morality are actually inborn, that you are born with tendencies to privilege certain kinds of um, moral choices over others. And it's not that the environment has no effect on that. It's not that those are set and rigid. Um, but that you are born with a, a first draft, as he says, of, of your morality. And then your experience after that basically rewrites that draft over and over again. But you do have these certain inborn tendencies. And he was arguing that, um, that what you find with liberals and conservatives is that they're, that liberals have a tendency to privilege some kinds of moral choices over others, which is not really that surprising, but let me say some specifics here. So he says that there are basically, I'm going to do this whole talk. No, I'm not. But basically that there are five foundations of morality, that there are some, some very essential kind of basic ideas about morals that he, all humans agree are important and that are, seem to be inborn. So uh, one of them is harm care, like basically taking care of people and making sure that like punishing people who harm others, and especially the weak. Uh, fairness and reciprocity, which is pretty self-explanatory. Um, purity and sanctity. So, you know, trying to preserve the... Yeah, I mean, that's pretty self-explanatory too. Authority and respect and in-group behavior, trying to preserve the, the core of a group. So what he, what he says is that across cultures, what you find is that while everybody thinks those things are important, all five of those things, that liberals, people with left of center politics, tend to think that harm, care, and fairness, reciprocity are more important, whereas conservatives tend to um, think purity, sanctity, authority, respect, and in-group behavior are more important. And he shows that this is true across a variety of cultures. Really, really interesting. And, um, and it just got me thinking about uh, well, he says that one of the effects of this is that liberals 
for better and worse, tend to uh, value new experiences more. That they tend to like trying new things and enjoy diversity and novelty. And I was thinking, well, yeah, that definitely applies to me. And, you know, I'm not going to get into a whole political discussion here, but my politics are pretty, well, they're, they're very left of center. Um, and I've noticed that in knitting and lots of other things that for better and worse, and I really do mean for better and worse, I like trying new things and I like new experiences and that's great in a lot of ways, but it also means that some things suffer in the process. So for one thing, it means I have a lot of works in progress. <laughs> Ooh, new shiny. It would, actually, it would be, I was thinking this morning, it'd be really interesting to know if on average, you know, statistically, if liberal knitters have more whips than conservative ones do. <laughs> Ooh, say it. Don't spray it. Sorry, I just hope I didn't get any on you. Uh, yeah, and I just and and this happens in a lot of other aspects of my life too, where I I tend to get bored really easily, and um, and I, I just sort of feel this constant battle inside myself, where on the one hand I I really like. I enjoy competency and comfort, you know, the sort of security of knowing that I know how to do this thing. This is something I know. Uh, this is familiar versus a very strong impulse that I have to, to get super bored with stuff that I already know and want to move on to something else. So sometimes I like doing stockinette projects and sometimes, you know, I want to just try something completely different. Um, so I, I kind of had those tendencies warring inside me, but I think I tend more toward the toward the ooh shiny wanderlust kind of thing, where I just my attention tends to drift all over the place. It's where the it's where the stereotype of the flaky liberal comes from, right? I am not above self mockery, people. I know this is true of me. So yeah, I mean, it just, it just really was very thought provoking to think that, you know, maybe there are certain very core tendencies that we have inside of us that are really almost uneradicable. But uh, one of the points that Haight makes at the end is of his talk is that, of uh, the TED talk, is that you really have to have both kinds of people in a society for it to work. You know, that if you've got uh, too many people who are that you really kind of need both of those tendencies in order to have both innovation and stability that, you know, they kind of play off of each other. There's an important dialectic between them, which I think is, is true. And, you know, I, I think internally a lot of us have that same push and pull or dialectic sort of thing going on where uh, we kind of get tugged in all different directions you know, a part of me just wants to stay home all the time and a part of me wants to go back to France right now. <laughs> Mostly I want to go to France. <laughs> all right. So with that in mind, let's get into uh, some of the reviewy goodness for today. Um, I, I love reviewing stuff. It's really, really fun. And uh, if you are somebody who makes things and you want me to review it, by all means, get in touch because this has been super fun. And I, I know many of you are enjoying this too. First thing to review today is this book. Mizanzi, South Africa on My Needles by Sally Jane Cameron. I love this book. I'm just going to jump right ahead to the punchline. It is gorgeous and it is really cool. So this is a book of designs that are inspired by the South African landscape and uh, the various cultures in that country, about which more in a second. And Sally Jean Cameron is, who is pink girl, pink hair girl on Ravelry. I wonder why she's got that name. Yes, that's her. <laughs> and she also hosts the Pink Hair Girl podcast, which you may have seen. 
and I hope you I hope you will check it out because it's she is a great deal of fun very charming so this book as you can see is really beautiful and I'm going to show you more of it in a moment it is 15 patterns which are really for the whole family um, she she models some I mean most of them are for women but there are a number of uh, baby and children patterns in here and also designs that would work just as well on men as they do on women so so yeah, a very eclectic mix. So this is her and her family, all wearing one of the hats that she designed. So there are 15 designs in here, uh, mostly for accessories, although there are a few, a few garments in here. In fact, I think... Yeah, the only garments are actually uh, baby garments or baby and children's garments. Um, there's a shawl, but most of them are accessories. And each one, I'll give you the, the overview page here. Isn't that cool? I love the, the, the layout on this book. Really, really cool. So each one is inspired by a different section of South Africa. And she does this cool thing at the beginning of the book where she shows you... A map of South Africa split up by region and then each of the numbers corresponds to like 33 here and 33 here it shows you that this is this is the design that is inspired by that area and the reason why they're kind of basically located in in two different sections of South Africa is that she grew up in Pretoria which is up in this area and now she lives in Cape Town which is down here on the southwest coast so, actually, before I, before I get into the book a little bit more, um, I want to say that I, one of the reasons why I think she sent this to me is that um, I've actually been to South Africa. I used to, when I was a historian, I, I was a historian of science, and uh, one of the areas of the world that I studied was actually South Africa. And I went on an archival trip for a couple of months there in 2003, I think. And uh, and I was in Cape Town the whole time, which is where Sally Jane lives now. And it, it's just, it is one of the most beautiful places I have ever, ever been. And really fascinating. I, one, I remember learning, actually, because I was doing some history of botany in the area. And, um, and I learned that there are basically five biotas in the world, like clusters of plants that are related to each other. If, so basically that you can split up the world into regions that have closely related plant systems. And there are five of them. And most of them are huge, as you might imagine, if you split up the world into five parts. Um, but there's one tiny one, and it is the western section of South Africa, the other four are these, you know, massive giant areas of the world. But there's one that's basically the western half of South Africa. So, in other words, what I'm saying is that the flowers and the plants there are like nothing you will see anywhere else, except insofar as the flowers have become so popular that they have have uh, been imported or exported to lots of other parts of the world. So you actually will have seen them because people love them. And the other thing about South Africa that I think is really fascinating, especially for this book in particular, is that it is a really interesting um, conglomeration of cultures because it started out, it was one of the, the first areas of Africa to be colonized, of Sub-Saharan Africa. And um, the Dutch and um, some Germans and French settled there in the 17th century, so really early on. And um, and then the English basically won the colony in the Napoleonic Wars in the early 19th century. And so that's, for the 19th and much of the 20th century, it was a British colony. Um, and on top of that, it is it was originally settled by multiple African peoples that have different languages. I mean, there's something like, I think 25 
official languages in South Africa. That might be a bit of an exaggeration, but it's it's at least 10. Uh, so yeah, just, I mean, and it, that's also caused all kinds of conflict, obviously. I mean, South Africa has had a very interesting history, but um, a very inspiring place in terms of inspiring knitwear. So let me show you, I think one of the really cool things that she does in this book is that she talks about, in each case, about uh, what inspired each of the pieces that she designed. So let me get to here. This is one of my favorite. The photography is unbelievably gorgeous in this book. This is Cape Point, which is a, a sort of peninsula that juts out into the, into the Atlantic Ocean. It's really, really beautiful, as you can see. So this is one of the, is the inspiration for the first set of designs. And she talks about how, uh, here, here's a piece of, here's the Cape Point cowl. She talks about how she chose the colors and the chevrons to represent the, the meeting of, of sky and ocean. And this promontory that, that sticks out into it. And there's a hat that uses the same stitch pattern and some mitts. Really, really pretty and very achievable. You know, these are not, none of these projects are extremely difficult. And in fact, one of the nice things she does is she explains the difficulty level and even gives you a little bit of text to explain, you know, why she calls it an intermediate level project and then tells you the skills that you would need in order to do it. And she has a, a page at the beginning that gives you a video, a links to tutorials about how to do some of the more uncommon techniques. As, I mean, there's great information with each of the patterns. Like here, she tells you how to measure your palm in order to decide what size you need and then all the different measurements to help you choose a size properly. Really, really great information. And um, great charts. And yes, and actually some photo tutorials in here to show you, you know, when she's got something to describe that is not easy to describe, but easier shown in pictures, she's got photographs showing you that. Table Mountain, which is the center point of Cape Town, is another inspiration. Here's one of the cool flowers that you, well, except for exporting, you only find naturally in, uh, in the western part of South Africa. Funny story about Table Mountain. <laughs> My husband and I took, there's a trolley you can take to the top. Actually, two funny stories about Table Mountain. There's a trolley you can take to the top. There's a cafe up there. And there are these funny little, I think they're rodents. Uh, they're mammals of some kind. Uh, they're kind of like squirrels, but more aggressive. And they, uh, they kind of like raccoons and squirrels. They like to be around people because people throw out lots of food. They're called rock dossies. And uh, they're about the size of a gopher, maybe. Super aggressive. And uh, we were at this cafe on the top of Table Mountain, and I watched this woman set down her tray that had a hot dog on it. She still had a hold of the tray. She looks away to say something to her friend, and this rock dossie runs across her tray, grabs the hot dog, tucks it under its armpit, and runs off on the other three legs. <laughs> and the woman turns around, and she's like, Oh my gosh! And she watches this rock dossie run off with her hot dog. Hilarious. And then uh, we decided to walk down the mountain because I thought, that'll be cool. You know, how hard can it be to walk down a mountain? As it turns out, it is super hard. And uh, maybe for the next week and a half, you will not be able to walk downstairs without going down backwards because your muscles are so sore from doing it. And I almost stepped on a snake. It was very scary. <laughs> I am a ridiculous person. So Table Mountain inspired this lovely shawl that you work in two colors. She made it with, looks like it's a South African yarn, Hartlam Franschoek. Franschoek is a, uh, a, I 
believe it's a place. Oh yeah, it's a town in wine country in South Africa. Yes, there is a wine country. French Protestants settled there in the uh, 17th, 18th century. Started growing wine. Folstreis. I think I'm saying that right. That's not for Connor word. I think it means ostrich. And she did this really cool ostrich plume cowl and has this really cool uh, idea for, because this is stockinette based, it'll curl up. So she sewed a, a lining into it to keep it from curling up and to give it a little extra warmth. Very, very cool. And there are all kinds of, this is one of my favorite projects in the book. This is a forest that is in that area on the West Coast. Um, it's called the Forest Cardigan. Look at this little sweet sweater. It comes in toddler and child sizes. It's all the way off the side. <laughs> High on a hill stood a lonely tiny goat herd. Ole, ole, ole. <laughs> He's so cute, little gnome. There's a little flower in his hand. Really, really cute. This is, so it's toddler to 10 year old sizing. And um, very, very simple, very sweet and well-designed pattern. And she's even, one of the things I love about this book is that she shows you, she's got it knit in multiple sizes in many cases. So here's, an older child. She looks like she's about seven or eight wearing the cardigan in a sized up size. So you can see that, you know, she really has sized these well. One thing about the book that um, is kind of unfortunate, and this is not really Sally Jane's fault, but uh, she ended up having to switch printers at the last minute and, um, and went with Amazon Create Space, which is really handy in a lot of ways because CreateSpace um, is a print-on-demand printer, so you can just order copies and have them printed in many different countries. So she was able to send these copies to me by having them printed in the U.S. and then shipped straight from the U.S. instead of having to mail them from South Africa. Um, the only trick with CreateSpace, and I've seen this with other people's books too, is that sometimes the color trueness isn't isn't very good and it really shows up in this picture. The reds just kind of completely baffled this uh, this page. Reds are are often a problem with printing. Um, it in many cases, like the I mean, the photos really came out well in almost every other case. But there are just a few spots where, and this is another one where the the pink hair and the all that red and the purple really kind of uh, confused the the printer. Um, but it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't mess with the clarity of the photographs. And there, like I say, there are just a couple of places where that didn't work out as well. Um, and I know she had to change at the last minute. Um, this I think is really cool. This is Johannesburg. And look at the, what she did with that inspiration. I love the juxtaposition of the urban landscape and then this cool geometric design that she did with it for socks. Those are the Josie socks. Hey there! <laughs> so I thought my camera was still recording and it turns out it wasn't. It had just turned itself off. So let me see if I can remember where I was. Uh, so the Josie socks, J-O-Z-I, I was just about to spell those, um, are just lovely. And the, the last thing I wanted to show you in the book are these. This is the page where she talks about her inspiration, the African fingerless gloves. And this woman shown at the top is, um, her name is Dorothy Moni Makalatiba, Makalatiba, I think. And uh, she created all these beautiful beaded pieces of jewelry that are the inspiration for three pairs of fingerless gloves that Sally Jane designed. And she's named each of them, each of Sally Jane and each of her siblings. Um, when she grew up in Pretoria, she was given uh, by friends of the family, given a Kosa name. I think that, I think she said that's where these are from Mapula, was Sally Jane's name. So that's the name of these gloves. And then Tandi, 
that's her sister. So here's the beaded piece, and then this is the interpreted into knitwear. And then Gape, Gape, is her brother's. I think she said it was her brother. And so this is the beaded piece, and then the piece it inspired. So really, really cool, and just gives a really rich sense. I mean, there are lots of other pieces in this book that are beautiful, but that gives you some sense of how she's used the landscape and the culture to inspire, uh, to inspire her knitting. And I, I just, I love this kind of stuff that, you know, you see so many, so many knitting books that are inspired by the places where classically the knitting tradition comes from, like uh, Iceland or uh, Scandinavia or Ireland. And it's just really fun to see some new stuff like, you know, all the Japanese knitting and um, the South African book. I just, I really like that kind of uh, geographic diversity being brought into, into the knitting world. Um, I will need to post links to how to go about getting the book. It is um, available both in uh, digital and printed form and is available now in both. Uh, Sally Jane is also doing a Where I Live Knit Along on the Pink Hair Girl group until the 31st of January. And she's got some really great prizes that she's picked up in South Africa to send to people. Um, you can either knit a pattern from her collection, and I, I think you get an extra entry into the giveaway if you do that, or you can knit something that is just inspired by where you live. So a really cool knit along that she's doing in the Pink Hair Girl group. And she is also has very generously let me do a giveaway of the book. So one of these copies is mine, the one that I've been flipping through and sticking my little posty notes on. Um, but uh, most of them, or most of them, one of them I am giving away. She sent me two copies very generously. So one of them I will send to you. Uh, it doesn't matter what country you live in. I mean, she was nice enough to send it to me from where she was, so I can certainly send it along to you. Uh, you just have to, as always, be a member of the group to join and one entry per person. I think the camera, I don't know, I won't repeat that part, but, oh, I just wanted to say about the printing. Um, so some of the reds were a little strange in the printing and I think the camera cut me off before I said that. Uh, I think probably in the, in the digital version, like her pink hair shows up a little less blown out than it does in the in the cover and I don't I, th this is one of the problems with going with create space is that it's incredibly convenient because you can print in many different parts of the world and uh, it's really well set up for self-publishing but occasionally it does these weird things like uh, reds it doesn't handle reds very well I've seen this with other people's books it's not just not just hers um, but like this picture in particular the color just didn't come out very true. The more red there is in the picture, basically, the more likely it is to kind of get blown out and and off. Uh, but I will say that none of the none of the photographs lost any clarity for that. Um, like you don't have any problem seeing the knitwear, and you know, frankly, most of the photography printed just beautifully. Um, and I, and she wanted me to explain too about the. The strange orientation of the book it's kind of more calendar like which i don't i mean whatever you know it, what difference does it make if it's turned this way or turned this way uh, but it basically happened because she had to switch printers at the last minute and um and the book was laid out in a way that she would have had to completely redo the layout and so it ended up that cal the calendar orientation just worked better for the way it was laid out so I don't really think that's a problem, but I just thought I would tell you that before you before you went and had a look. But definitely check it out, Mzanzi. It's a beautiful, beautiful collection. Um, I have another review for you today, this time from Uruguay, i.e. Manos del Uruguay, a yarn review. I'm going to review their, their yarn, Franca, which is a lovely bulky weight yarn. Here's what's left over after I knit something up with it. 
And as with, if you've ever knit with Manos before, you know that they have beautiful, they do beautiful dye work. And Franca is all done in, um, well, let me give you sort of the basic facts about the yarn first. It is a 100% superwash merino. And it is a super bulky. So it says on the tag that it gets 10 stitches over four inches. I actually got nine. And I've also seen some patterns where they get eight. So it's, you know, it can be really variable what kind of gauge you get with this, but it is definitely super bulky. You would use a, a US 13 or 15 with this, which is a, uh, I don't have a, a little thing handy to tell me what that is in metric. Uh, there are 114 yards and 150 gram skein. So this is actually more yardage than you would find in a typical super bulky yarn, which is nice because then you can get like you could get a really good sized cowl out of this, for instance, out of just one skein. It comes in uh, 12, at least that's what is on the Fairmount Fibers site, their distributor. Uh, they have 12 different tonal colors, the sort of semi, the kind of somewhere between a semi solid and a variegated. I mean, they're basically, it's all one color, but you know, a pretty wide variation in that color. So this one is. Um, what is this color called? Deep Sea. This is color number 13. And most of their colors are uh, jewel tones or very interesting pastels. There were a couple that were not that, but that's kind of the, the basic palette. And it retails for about $36, which partly reflects the fact that this is a lot of yardage for a super bulky, um, but also reflects the fact that Manos is a cooperative. It is a fair trade company. And um, yeah, I wanted to, well, I mean, you probably have heard of Manos before, but it's basically a cooperative that started in the, I believe the late sixties and um, has really helped revive uh, some of the, here, let me get their website up here so I can, so I had all this stuff up yesterday when I started recording and and then it just, uh, well, things happened with the computer. All right. So yes, Manos del Uruguay. Oh, where are you? <laughs> oh, I had a page that was telling me, ah, here we go. Okay. So yeah, founded in 1968. Um, and it says it was begun by five women whose goal was to develop economic opportunities for women in a country where there were and are still few opportunities for work. Um, they began modestly by selling handcrafts at local shops and the annual agricultural show in Montevideo. In time, spinning, dyeing, weaving, and knitting became the focus of the co-op's efforts. And uh, so this is all hand-dyed yarn. And the cool thing is that they actually tell you inside, you know, which, which place made it. And this is the Fraile Muerte Cooperative. I think that's how you say that in Uruguay. And, um, and it looks like Leticia was the person who dyed the yarn, which is very cool. Sometimes the tags tell you what sheep it came from. Sometimes it tells you who the dyer is. I think that's pretty cool. Um, so yeah, the yarn is, has been distributed in the United States for a while. Uh, but one of the cool things about the company is that it says they provide health insurance, retirement pensions, paid vacations, and paid maternity leaves for their members. And uh, the very first, I think this is really very cool. The very first kindergartens in Uruguay were begun by the Manos Cooperative to provide childcare for the artisans. So it's a really, really great company and well worth spending the extra money on the yarn. And I really like the yarn a lot. Um, there are some caveats for those of you, if you've ever worked with uh, a singles yarn before, particularly in Merino. And here I'm thinking probably the most popular case of this is uh, Malabrigo Worsted. 
if you've ever worked with that and it drives you crazy how much it pills or if you really don't like yarn that pills this would not be a good choice for you uh, this is a singles in the same way that I mean it's really almost like a bulky version of Malabrigo worsted so what a singles means is that this is just one ply it's not plied together it's just one lightly twisted puff ball of merino and it pills pretty wildly. I mean, I just in winding it, I had some pills coming off. So if that's a deal breaker for you, then this is not a good choice. But the upside of that is that this is super, super soft. Because the more you twist and ply yarn, the, the less soft it is. I mean, it'll still be squishy, but it won't be, you know, just like, oh, baby, they're soft. And this is like baby chick soft yarn. My husband put it on, put this hat on his head and he was like, oh. <laughs> so, you know, use it for stuff that isn't going to get a lot of abrasion. You wouldn't, I wouldn't make a sweater out of this yarn. I mean, it's too bulky for that anyway, but I wouldn't make socks out of it unless you wanted to just felt like crazy, which maybe slippers would be good. But I knit this hat. In fact, I designed a hat with this yarn and I basically made it a kind of slouchy, well, it's kind of slouchy. It's sort of a, a beanie that I made to kind of look like a slouchy hat by, I did some short rows on this part so that the crown shaping would all toss to the back of the hat instead of on the top, which I thought kind of gave it a little bit better fit. And uh, I don't know, just kind of interesting little little feature to it. It's just super bulky yarn is the kind of yarn that you can't really do anything super complex with. Uh, I did the that leaf lace hat with um, a couple of weeks ago, but I found that especially with the when you add the variegation in, that it just really wanted to be something simple. So I just did this reverse stockinette hat. I'm going to write up the pattern and release it fairly soon. Um, but basically, you knit it inside out. You knit the knit side so that you can mostly knit your way through and uh and you do some like i said some short rows so that the whole crown shaping is actually kind of angled off to the side you could really wear it either way it's just that the ends kind of stick out on the inside so yeah super easy and um i really enjoyed working with it i think the colors are beautiful that's a pretty true, it's a little less saturated than it's showing up on my camera. But I love the very, ooh, too blown out. I love the variation in color that you get with this yarn. It's very soft, like I say. Um, really a pleasure to work with. Um, what was I going to say about this? Um... Oh, I was going to, that I'm I'm going to call the, the hat Waltzer, W-A-L-T-Z-E-R, which is the German word for the tilt-a-whirl ride at uh, carnivals. <laughs> That's the little offset crown shaping kind of reminded me of tilt-a-whirls. So I want to thank uh, Stitchcraft Marketing got in touch with me about reviewing this yarn. And, um, and they and Fairmount Fibers, who is the U.S. distributor, actually sent it to me. So I wanted to thank both of them for for letting me try that out. If you are looking for quick gift knitting, this is definitely a good yarn for you. And uh, you can find actually a couple of free patterns on Fairmount Fibers' website. So I will make sure to to link to that site so that you can see. I think they've got a cowl and a a really cute ear flap hat and some other some other patterns for this. And my hat is going to come in two sizes so that children and adults can wear it. It's really stretchy. So I have a 24 inch head and this is an 18 inch hat and it fits me perfectly. So it stretches quite a bit. Okay. So last thing is that I wanted to show you how to pick up a drop stitch with a crochet hook. So I just need to get my little supplies out. This might be the kind of thing that it was best shown if I re-angle the camera. So hang on a second. 
All right, for our last bit of wanderlust today, we're going to look at what happens when your stitches go wandering, <laughs> as in when they drop off the needle. So here I've got a stitch. Well, it hasn't really fallen off. I made it fall off. But as you can see, it's fallen down two rows here. I've got two little strings that it's left behind. So what we're going to do is use a crochet hook to pick them up. And what you want to do is try to find a crochet hook that is at least close in size to the knitting needle that you've used. And the way, the easiest way to tell is that is to look at the metric measurements. So this is a size four knitting needle, which is uh, in metric 3.5 millimeters. And in U.S. sizes, this crochet hook is a size E, but it's also 3.5 millimeters. So they're the same size. You don't have to get exactly the same size, but it's good to be close. So. It's pretty easy to use a crochet hook to pick up stitches. All you really have to do is put the knitting needle from, or sorry, the crochet hook from front to back through the stitch that's been dropped. And then you just use the hook to grab the first rung of the ladder. See these little bars of, I'll call them rungs of the ladder, those are the rows that have been, that the stitches have dropped off. So I'm just going to grab that first one, that first rung, and pull it through the stitch. And then to keep the stitch oriented the right way, I'm going to have to pull this out, put it back in from front to back. You just don't want to twist the stitch. And pull through that second rung. Now I've got it all the way back up. Just deposit that stitch back on the left hand needle and it's all good to go again. <laughs>